Welcome back to What's New with Mead. We are in episode number 32, and I'm here with some um, really incredible mead makers over at Drinking Horde Meadery. And I am uh, super excited to chat with them about everything they have going on in their world. So, gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Glad you're here. Thanks for having us. Hey, thank you. We're, we're super happy to be here. I'm, uh, I'm Evan, one of the owners. My wife and I own it. This is Nick, our uh, master of mayhem, our curator of chaos. Ambassador um, of Buzz. Ambassador of Buzz. I like that title even better. And then we also have uh, Nick Perez with us down here, uh, one of our newest members to the team. Glad to have him. He's also probably got more homebrewing experience than the rest of us at this point, too. So <laughs> hey, good one valuable. to have on the team. Yeah. Sweet. Hey, well, I'm, uh, we chatted before with you guys as Monday night mead and I had a good time and um, that I, I coming off of that I was like I want to do it again and it just so happens that I have a podcast and I was like let's let's do the same thing but flip the script a little so here we are now you guys you guys have been gracious enough to send me uh, <laughs> send me some mead as well now I have poured your uh, mead hito which by the way the moment I opened it I was I swore as an actual mojito it's like the aroma is super awesome and it, it tastes great i mean this thing is um, it. arguably too crushable so hopefully uh, summer. i got a backup bottle of mead just in hey. case we start running dry over here i got a hey. backup bottle of mead hito as well what do you know so i i opened that one that's awesome that is absolutely Oop. go ahead Sorry, I was just gonna say that is absolutely um, you know something that that we kind of that we get and understand here is is the crushableness of of the mead. Um, it uh, it's something that we definitely you know let people know um, to be careful with. And you're abs- you're right that that mead hito is is silly how fast that bottle empties out. We actually put a hole in the bottom so it seems like you're drinking. Fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I opened up the meat hito and I have, because uh, you also sent me the root beer, so I'm drinking that as well. And this was also one that I opened and I, I'm i mega impressed uh, aromatic wise, um, it, taste wise too, but aromatics, you guys are, in, are um, nailing these these mojito aromas and these root beer aromas. Like it's incredible. Well, thank you. They're, uh, those guys in the back make magic. <laughs> well, I'm I'm mega impressed, and I just um, I'm hoping that I can save them enough to share with my fiance because I'm sure she will love to try them as well. Um, okay, so Good let's man. go ahead. And, Good man. <laughs> let's get into uh, some questions. I want to first talk about you guys, and you you briefly talked about yourself. Now, can you tell us a little bit about the history of Drinking Horn? Uh, when did you start? You know, just those basic things. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we got started making sales anyway, back in uh, February 2017. Um, As you know, with mead, it it takes a while to ferment and get through the whole process to start with. And then the licensing procedure took, uh, I mean, we spent, I don't know, 16 months licensing before we could even start making anything. So it was uh, was a lot of paperwork. But I got started with the company. Um, I made a whole bunch of mead for uh, my wife and I's wedding. Um, Because of the whole honeymoon thing, you know, you're supposed to have enough honey wine to last a moon cycle. It's where the term honeymoon comes from. We have a lot of mead tied things in our culture that we just kind of forgot about along the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so made a bunch for that. And everybody ended up loving it so much. Uh, They were drinking all that instead of drinking the beer. And uh, I was kind of looking for a career change path at the moment and uh, figured, well, if everybody's going to be drinking all this mead, maybe maybe I could charge them for it. (laughs) No, it's great. Okay, so 2017, um, you guys are still pretty fresh, but you are obviously uh, putting your footprint out there for your community. Um, do you guys have, um, are, are you one of the only meteries in your little area or are you guys amongst many? Yeah, so up in Flagstaff where we're at, um, just a little background of our, our town, we're up at 7,000 feet. So it's a mountain town in Arizona. Um, and when people normally think, and for good reason of Arizona, you think of Wiley e. Coyote cartoons and, you know, saguaros and cactus and stuff like that. But uh, we're up here in the Ponderosa Pines. And so um, you weren't asking about a geographic <laughs> kind of thing. But um, so we are the only meadery in Steph. Um, Arizona, and there are a total now of, I believe, four or five. Well, there's, 
I think five total. There's five hours. total. Yeah. yeah. So us, um, a little meter you may have heard of, Superstition Meter, uh, is down south um, in Prescott. And then we have Scale and Feather in the Phoenix area and Arizona Mead Comp- Arizona Mead Co. Uh, down the Phoenix area as well. And then there's a fifth one that really is is the tiny, like, um, it's probably really cool. I haven't had a chance to get down there, but a tiny one down in southern, southern Arizona, um, down in Sonoida. So. That's great. So I, uh, yeah, yeah that's breweries. a lot. It's not, it's not like breweries. I, I'm very envious because here in Oklahoma, we're a meat desert in a lot of ways. And so we have um, one meadery in the whole state and they don't, I've never found anything in, on the shelves from them. And I know they produce, but I hmm. feel like it's, it's some weird situation. So uh, I am envious of you guys' ability to not only make meat at the commercial scale, but be able to, if you wanted to, purchase it without having to do the Vino Shipper thing or to drive you know, 500 miles to find a meadery. So I think that's uh, a super valuable thing to have as commercial mead makers too, not just... Um, peons people who just make them for fun yeah it's i mean it's it's helpful as a business too um one of the things i was taught i took a lot of business classes to try to learn what i was doing kind of while i was doing it and uh, diversification of sales is something that's always like an important thing to strive for with any business you limit yourself too much and you get yourself backed into a corner and so we have the you know the online sales the wholesale and the retail with our, our mead hall and uh I mean, the, the wholesale stuff kept us alive for good chunks of last year because 2020 was, it was 2020. <clears throat> so, uh, so it kept us alive for, for a good chunk of it. We had almost 100 retailers before, uh, before COVID. And we've definitely, there's, there's been quite a few places have to close down and whatnot. Mm. You know, restaurants, bars, everything all around. But uh, we're working on building it back up. And there's new places opening up. And we're currently adding places in almost weekly, if not multiple times a week. So it's coming along. It's coming along bit by bit. That's that's awesome. So on that front, I do want to kind of talk about how COVID has affected you. You just said, obviously, it affects your, your um, meat hall where you can get meat on draft. Can't really have that during COVID. Uh, what other ways did you see COVID drastically affect your world? Oh, man. I mean, um, we were doing delivery for a little while there. Uh, this was just, just previous to Perez coming on. Like, we were doing delivery for... Uh, like two people's right to people's door. So they would call us throughout the week and I would kind of collect orders. And then on Thursdays I would go out and I would, or maybe it was even daily and we'd go out and drive around and drop off mead right to people's doorsteps. They actually, some folks really enjoyed it. They got pretty used to it. And we're like, can we just set this up as like a regular thing? Are you sure you have to get rid of it? Like, I really like not leaving my house for mead. <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, a lot of that part probably had to do with it. It was because you were coming to the door. They're like, just oh, the shining smile and face, <laughs> greasy as ever, coming to your door. <laughs> yeah, um, I definitely want to add on um, just as a an overlying thing that that um, Evan and Kelly. As, as business owners during this pandemic, it was absolutely inspiring to watch what they did and the work that they put in and the ideas they came up with. Um, if there's, you know, I, he doesn't have time to write a book about it, but if there's a book written about how to survive the pandemic, not only survive, but honestly to, to you know, it's, it's hard to say thrive, but like we, we maneuvered and, and did well with it. So the things that he can talk about right now about what we did with COVID, including, you know, delivery and, and some other things. Um, yeah, it was, I just want to put that out there that, that they did an amazing, amazing job and to be able to watch, um, you know, some businesses struggle, some businesses try to figure out and them to just, you know, put the nose to the grindstone and, and, and kick butt um, during COVID was, was awesome to watch. Well, and it's, it's not just me either. You know, it's not just Kelly and I, like it's, it's our whole crew working together as a crew and it's, and it's Flagstaff supporting us too. Even when we were closed and not able to serve drinks, people were still, they get our bottles elsewhere. They go to Whole Foods, they go to the bottle shops and everything else. And people were coming down and buying bottles, you know, straight from us, which is, which is better for us as a company. Um, and it was, it was awe inspiring to see the, the community of Flagstaff really supporting us and helping us get through those times. Yeah, I remember you guys still having paper in the windows and, you know, trying to open up a brand new location when COVID happened. And it's like, you know, I got to go in and get something to go because that's the best I can do. Wow. Well, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, no, absolutely. We had uh, a long time and it was, was kind of touch and go. And it was, 
I mean, we were supposed to be having our grand opening right as everything was shutting down, basically. So it was like, oh, sweet timing. Oh. Oh, well, I'm very thankful that you guys have been able to stay afloat, if not thrive. It sounds like you guys, while it's been a little turbulent, have um, continued to be a growing business. And um, I think that's that's a testimony to your not only your mead, but your fa- uh almost a faculty that's the teacher and me your your staff and everyone working in there um so now i know coming from uh, coming from you gary that is quite a compliment (laughs) i appreciate that i i am uh i love getting to support you guys and i'll do whatever i can um okay so i do want to ask you about uh i have two of your meads in front of me now i want to know what's your your um staple your flagship mead what would you say is like your your main producer or main thing you produce uh, it's i mean traditional is kind of uh, our number one seller pretty much every month that uh, that you know except for the seasonal the seasonal of that month will always uh, sell better than the traditional but traditional is definitely kind of our staple we have we have five flagships basically and it would be a uh, traditional strawberry apple bluetooth and pomegranate um, we're slowly bringing in prickly pear and that root beer that you're drinking there just because mm-hmm. like we made one batch of those and then we would go through them in like three weeks and they're not huge tanks, you know, they're three, five barrels, 3.5 barrels. So we're using them basically as like a four barrel cause we don't have any Krausen space in there. Mm-hmm. And, um, we were just going through some of those so fast that like, we just, we just have to keep them on. People get cranky if they don't have their prickly pear. <laughs> That's, yeah, I, I've had a, uh, one prickly pear mead in my time, and I remember immediately after I drank it, I was like, I have to do this. And then I was like, oh, wait, I live in Oklahoma, uh, <laughs> so I'll have to plan a little better before I can start one. But they're good from what I've had. You could take a little trip down to Texas. Texas definitely has some prickly pear cactus there. True, true. Oh, no. That's Don't they? Pretty sure they do. I, I you can go visit so. the wonderful land of El Paso. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I lived in Texas for about nine months, and it was a tiny town in Texas, so not really anywhere big, semi close to Amarillo. But that was my my only time in Texas, and it was uh, it had no meat. I'll tell you that that's for sure. Uh, where I was at, at least. <laughs> so, so what is um, your? Uh, I guess your staple honey to use. Do you guys uh, gravitate around one one kind? Are you experimenting? What's your What's your thing? I think I think Perez can handle a bit of that one. He's he's been in there about four months now, at least almost maybe even five. Yeah, I mean the main honey that we're using is orange blossom honey from Mountaintop Honey. Um, you know, that's our local producer that's up here. So you know, trying to support local in, in every, every sense that we can. So it's pretty much the main staple that we're using all the time. Great. Do you use any varietals, even as an experimental things, like you're throwing in buckwheat just to see what would happen or? No, we I mean, I know that there's a, a we... yeah, I was going to say, I know that there's no, a bucket of almond honey the coffee. Mm -hmm. coffee blossom yeah we do the coffee mead with a a bit of almond honey yep yeah coffee blossom or i think it's it's actually straight up coffee so there's all the caffeine and everything else in there it's not a mead that you can really drink at least me it's not a mead i can drink after about 2 p.m because i'll be awake all night um because it was it was highly caffeinated um but we use a bit of the almond honey for that um it's tasty it's just very dark dark earthy honey Interesting. I haven't heard of almond honey. That's a first. I, uh, I definitely need to try that. I've done coffee blossom before and I liked it a lot. I only made like a, it was basically a half gallon recipe. So it wasn't, wasn't huge, but it was very interesting. Almond honey. That sounds like fun. It's, it's cool stuff. It's kind of, it's dark and, uh, it's got almost like a, a nutty sort of flavor to it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, obviously it's got a nutty flavor to it. When I said they that, Nick looked yeah. at me, I realized what I had said. But uh, no, it really is. It's like a very, it's very rich, very earthy. So have you had um, avocado blossom honey before? I have not. I have not. I would say if you ever get your chance to get a hold of some, what you're describing to me is that same is world. Of course, uh, almond honey is going to be a little bit different just naturally but um i think avocado blossom hits those same marks so that'd be something to look into 
I'm able to get uh, it around me um, some, but obviously it's I mean, not on, on the homebrew side, guess- I've only really been able to get like mesquite, wildflower, and orange blossom in this area. I really mm-hmm. wouldn't even know where to try to find some of those varietals other than, you know, online and have to pay shipping costs to get some. I've been fortunate enough to find some good online sources that the shipping is not too crazy. So Sweet. Um, I've been playing around with those. I, you know, I've been playing around with a lot of blueberry blossom honey, which has been, I mean, holy cow. I think that's mm. my next favorite honey to use just because everything it uh, gives. So those are, those are always fun. And it's always fun what for are, me to hear. What are some notes with that blueberry? Um, so I get... Well, my description of the honey is awkward because I get like a berry, of course, blueberry, but it's not like your traditional bright blueberry. It is like uh, close to an elderberry, like a dirty, uh, earthy um, uh, elderberry kind of taste to me. It does have like, it doesn't have a lot of like bright floral notes. So it's really useful for... um, Honestly, a boche. Like I did a boche with it, and it was fantastic. So, uh, those are the main things I get. Of course, I feel like that gets to be a little bit tough because somebody else could walk in here and try something and go like, "I don't taste any blueberry." You know, I get I get orange, and you're like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> so, um, but those are those are the things I sort of pick up from it. Nice. Yeah, it's. I, I think that's one of the it's it's somewhat kind of like frustrating but it's also really cool that we all have these different nuances you know in our taste buds and and it's kind of fun to be able to describe at the same time you like like you said like oh what do you mean you don't taste this um but uh when you when you said dirty earthy elder um barry i was just reminded of like you know some of my nicknames back in the day so oh man uh <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so I want to get into a little bit about um, your process of mead making. Um, first question, obviously, I'm assuming you guys use nutrients in your brewing. What are those nutrients and how do you like to add them in? We, we definitely do like a, a, stand, a staggered nutrient addition to it. Um, I think it helps keep the yeast happy. I think sometimes if you add all your nutrients at the beginning, they can kind of sink down and end up in sort of a unaccessible nutrient bank down at the bottom of the, uh, your carboy or whatever. And you can just end up staggering things and the, the staggered schedule. Like we don't end up trying to add anything, um, past like about halfway through fermentation, a little bit further than that. Um, just going by the numbers and, uh, and it ends up working pretty well. I think we've, it's been pretty successful so far. We've tried a few different methods way back in the day that weren't quite as, uh, not as speedy and not as a uh, tasteless, I guess, of a fermentation. Um, and then we're pretty much using a lot of uh, a little, trying to think of everything we, we use in the back right now, but it's a- uh, Call it a house blend, Nick, right? Do you know the, the names of the- yeah, it's a, a house blend. It is. It's a couple of different nutrients all kind of blended together, um, primarily focused more on like a, a phosphorus base as opposed to a nitrogen base for it. I got to stop wiggling in my chair. We'll probably pick that noise up. But uh, yeah, and, uh, and doing this staggered nutrient addition has really, really helped out with that. Um, all the Fermade stuff is never a bad product to go to. Um, so we don't get too specific with it. Yeah, (laughs) that's fair well so i've never really experimented with phosphorus based nutrient additions do you have any uh maybe coming from a homebrew perspective where you were throwing in let's say uh, dap which is is of course nitrogen as its main thing have you noticed any difference between them like taste or fermentation speed or anything or is uh, this is the science in me popping out (laughs) Yeah, yeah, and I'd love and I'd love for Perez to speak to this with his home brewing as well. Um, but for us, like commercially, I, it, the nutrients themselves, as long as they're good, we have had some nutrients that have been a little questionable because of expiration dates or whatever. Um, as long as the nutrients are good, it, it seems my experience, and this could just be our you know individual experience with it, but is that when you add them is a little more important than like specifically what you add, as long as you're getting, and that being you know 
saying that, like making sure that you don't have too much or too little of anything. Cause if you put stuff in too much or too, you know, too much, you're going to end up tasting it because your yeast aren't going to go through it. You put in too little, you're going to stress out your yeast and they're going to end up, you're going to have, you know, stressed out pineapple flavors or whatever going into your product. And uh, so kind of trying to find that balance where not too much and not too little. So more of a, more of a volume of it. And when you add that volume, then like necessarily like the specifics, as long as you're kind of covering all those bases for sure. I think from the homebrew side, you know, Fermade does pretty well to give you their instructions on, you know, dosages and they say, you know, feed at a third sugar depletion. And you know, I, I think if you go beyond a certain point, you know, it may not, uh, the yeast may not use those nutrients and then you might get some off flavors. You know, I just uh, visited my homebrew store and tried some new stuff. I got Fermade O, Fermade K, some DAP. They even got some clarifiers to, to try out for the first time. So you know, trying a combination of everything and just kind of testing it as it goes to see what'll work best, you know, because before then I had never really done nutrient additions and, you know, had issues with yeast stalling out, you know, even just, uh, you know, last uh, Black Friday, I bought myself a new setup that had temperature controlling on it. So, I mean, that's been great. You know, not, not many home brewers will have a way to keep temperature control. And that's been a world of a difference. You know, the last batch that I made from, you know, start to fully fermented was like, 13, 14 days, which was amazing. I was just so surprised that everything, uh, you know, had, had, had been uh, eaten up at that point and basically had an alcoholic product, but now it's just, you know, the, the waiting game, letting it clarify and settle out. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting because the, obviously um, there's things like Tosna, like 2.0, 3.0, there's um, all of these uh, processes by which people have figured out you know, to add certain amounts. And I, I got to talk to um, Bray Denard, who's the, the creator of the Bray's One Month Mead. And he's like, I mean, I think I enjoy the science of mead. That dude takes it to like the next level. I felt like I was like drowning in so much amazing knowledge. But he basically was talking about how, you know, stuff like DAP, um, once a mead hits 9%, the yeast sort of change and don't take that nutrient from DAP. Um, in the same way. And so it doesn't become effective. And so stuff like that, it's like super in-depth knowledge that you don't really need to know as like a first time mead maker. But when you get further along and you run into stalling things or you run into problems, knowing the innards of, of the scientific mead making is helpful. And it's funny you guys talking about, uh, you know, um, Nick Perez talking about you having problems with stalling this mead back here is one that I, I am uh, I'm titling the video, um, Punishing My Yeast for Existing. And I have like a, a heat wrap around it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, I'm using a, a yeast and basically fermenting at the top of its range, giving it zero nutrients and just trying to, to punish it, so to speak, just, for, just to be stupid. But um, I'm curious to see what the resolve is with that one, making it obviously trying to stress it out. I know that I'm probably gonna have a bad product, uh, but it's interesting. It's, it's just fun. And I'm sure somebody will laugh at it, hopefully on YouTube. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, I briefly started watching that video I think, with I think the, the guy awesome. that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd, I'd gone to his website, saw that he was a PhD, has a bunch of articles and stuff on there. So I had just started watching it before my girlfriend came in and was like, hey, pay attention to me. Don't don't be watching your meat videos right now. So <laughs> I still got to, still got to finish watching that one. Oh, that's a good one. I would recommend, <laughs> recommend watching it for sure. Yeah. Just want to cut it in here real fast and say, if you're enjoying the podcast and want to support the channel, feel free to check out manmademead.com. It's the one-stop shop to find recipes, brewing information, all of the YouTube series and Amazon affiliate links that support the channel. You can simply click on the links and when you purchase through that link, it actually, a, a part of the profit goes back to the channel and helps me continue to create content for you all. So I hope you will join me there and thanks for listening. Back to the show. I, I really like the whole idea of fermenting things just to test stressors. So like after you do this one, you can do about eight more where you just test like one stressor at a time. Uh huh. You know? Cause like, it is like a, a huge component with yeast is that whole, like the whole philosophy is like, try to keep them as happy as you can, but without oxygen, 
you know? And so it's that, uh, that sort of like finding the specific stressors and it would be really interesting to see what like just a high temp ends up doing flavor wise. We've ended up when we, when I was doing homebrew, the higher temperature that my stuff was fermenting at, it seemed like the more like, what was it? Esters that it ended up having. And it sort of gave it that like, kind of tastes like you could put it in your truck sort of thing and really took a, uh, yeah. a long time to sort of mellow out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, the little experiment you got going right there just reminds me, I mean, it's almost like going in and seeing what like, um, you know, a Norse summer fermentation would have been like, you know, almost mm-hmm. like a historical mead you've got going up there and to almost appreciate <laughs> some of the, some of the other things we've got these days by, uh, by sipping on that mead and remembering that that may have been, you know, well, that's probably the reason they threw a bunch of fruit and a bunch of spices and herbs in there um, yeah. is what that came out with. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, this one will be interesting. I, I doubt it'll taste great. And if it does, I'll be shocked. But um, you saying that I took a Kvike strain one time and I pushed it um, unintentionally up to 110 Fahrenheit and it was still cranking. And I was like, okay, I guess you're just rocking. Um, Cause I had a heat wrap around it and it was the middle of summer and I forgot about it. I put it out in like a sunroom so it would just get going. <laughs> And I, I pulled it off because I was like, I don't, probably don't think I need to do this the whole time. But it reached that point and the, the yeast were still kicking. So obviously some yeast are very capable and others would just explode at that point. So how did it taste? Uh, it was um, it was okay. It was the problem with it was not, I don't think the heat, it was a buckwheat traditional mead, which is like mm. you're just chewing on cement, you know, hay essentially and just it's just not a not a great um honey to use as a traditional so it's great for mixing but not as its base so i think if i had pushed like a regular you know a clover honey and something else it would have been okay maybe an experiment for the future oh absolutely i like a little idea of like some buckwheat with some hops in it that might make a that might make a pretty tasty mead right there you get your get your grass and your hops kind of all together i shouldn't have said that on here no (laughs) it's like a true hazy yeah yes okay so so talking about um you know we're kind of talking about mead myths and and the science behind it are there any um myths mead myths that you heard of when you got into the brewing scene that you like lived by and you know i think the one i i'm thinking of specifically is that you shouldn't touch your mead until it's a year old. That was like the standard phrase. Like don't, you know, make the mead, put it in a bottle. Don't touch it till a year because it's not going to be good. Are there anything like that that you guys remember? Yeah. I think that the big one for me was, uh, I think you guys probably all have your own, own ones too, but the big one for me was the fermenting temperature. So I felt like everywhere that I was reading about mead when I was homebrew and was like, ferment cold. If you can ferment cold, ferment cold, ferment it cold, ferment it 55 degrees. Cold fermentation is a better fermentation, less off flavors, blah, 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 blah. And uh, I feel like I read that everywhere, but I think I might've just been reading like an echo chamber sort of thing too. You know what I mean? Cause uh, I tried when we finally, you know, when we got tanks and I first started being able to, to control down to like a decimal of a degree, what things were fermenting at, don't ferment at 55, ferment in a happy zone for the yeast. It was a, it was just super slow fermentation and you would always get like an off flavor coming to it. And so, uh, mm, ferment, ferment fermented at, I mean, they make all those charts. Every yeast comes with a chart that shows, or you can at least find it online that shows like it's optimal zones. Like you were talking about before and like, don't stress out your yeast more than you need to. If you're going for the tastiest thing you can make, if you're going for experimental stress, those little buggers. out. (laughs) I feel like the scientists have done a really great job to tell you where to ferment that particular yeast and what range to. Yeah, no, I think that the the science has been done. I get a little frustrated sometimes when people um, uh, say, you know, why would you ever put ferment? You know, yeast don't need nutrients. They fermented just fine in in puddles back, you know, 4,000 years ago. (laughs) Well, uh, who, who really knows if that's true? So stuff like that is, is interesting to me. Um, it does make me think about an experiment I do want to do because I know that over at um, Groenfeld Meadery, um, he, Ricky Klein, likes to take his D47 and push it 
to uh, not like beyond its limits, but to a higher temperature range, which prompted me to go, what would happen if you fermented one at the bottom of the D47 range, one in the middle and one at the top, and you just see what happens. So, you know, talking about that, I really want to put those things to the test because I feel like um, I, I haven't seen a video like that on YouTube for one, but also I, I love the nerdy side of like, you know, what if I change one variable <laughs> and what will happen? So stuff like that's always interesting to me. Um, okay. So yeah, I'm glad, next. I'm glad you're, uh, you, Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I, okay. Um, I, I was just going to say, I'm glad that you, uh, that you are the one um, doing all those experiments and, and documenting it. That's, that's cool that we'll, you know, have this storehouse of, of at least, you know, one person's experimentation with these different variables and everything. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I just appreciate that, that you're there doing that on a homebrew scale. Um, while yeah. we can't, cause we're busy, you know, making the big batches, um, you can dig in on that science. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh yeah. And like, I, I just want to touch on like the, the myth thing. Cause I think one of the biggest myths with myths with need, oh man, that's a, that's a tongue twister, is uh, where the heck did it even start? You know what I mean? That's one of the biggest things and not necessarily with like the fermentation of it and all the rest of it, but, but where did we start doing it? Like there's, there's some seriously old evidence of it, but there is no, there's no solid, there's no solid history of mead. It's something that like, it was kind of lost. People got to write about it while they were drinking, I guess. <laughs> no, I think that, uh, um, I know that some books and things have briefly talked about it, but I do believe with it being the oldest beverage that there are still a lot of things we don't know. And it's very interesting to me that it is one of the oldest, if the oldest beverage, and yet um, there's still so many question marks surrounding it. I feel like we know so much about beer at this point, so much about winemaking, and we're still discovering new mead making techniques and everything that honestly improves our, our knowledge and improves our, our needs in general. So I do enjoy that we're getting to that point, but it's just, it's kind of interesting to look back and go, why have we not talked about this sooner? Do you, do you think that that frustration might be almost kind of a lasting fr frustration? Because as you're saying that, we learn all this stuff about beer and about wine. Um, one of the things I love about meat is how simple of a drink it is. And maybe there's just not ever going to be as much depth of knowledge because there doesn't need to quite be, you know, honey, yeast, and water, um, the simplicity. I, I'm all in for digging in, into the science and stuff like that. But when you start adding things like grains and, you know, all the different strains, um, of, you know, sacro that are used and, and the different techniques and the temperatures of mashing, like, like so much more to that, which again, I'll say that's one of the things I fell in love with coming from beer into meat. I love the simplicity, but I feel like there might be, you know, you might be start, we might eventually start looking for more than there is with this beautiful, simple drink. I definitely believe that, um, well, I'll say this. I believe that it is a simple by concept drink and alcohol to make. However, I think the entry level mead is, is about here. And then to really make a great mead, it is a huge jump. And I, I'm just thinking back from my own experience of, I would, uh, when I first started, I didn't really think about nutrients. I didn't think about the, the stuff that, uh, I guess the sciencey stuff that was intended to help the process and my products would end up just a little bit off. And it's not that I was um, necessarily doing things wrong. I was still adding things in, but because of my palate and because of uh, just a, a lack of understanding of what to expect, I think I struggled for a long time to make something I was really pleased with. Now I could be very critical of myself and I don't want to dissuade anyone who listens to this who might be a beginning mead maker to say your meads suck or, or anything like that. But I do want to say that um, diving in and, and uh, one, developing your palate, but two, just making a ton of mead will, will reveal your flaws, but also allow you to continue learning through the process. So I agree that in concept it is easy, but I have found the wormhole opens up to this vast realm of not only flavor possibilities, but 
experimentation. And again, I'm coming from a science perspective, so I'm probably not the best person to talk about this with. Oh, no, I, I totally agree with that. I think, I think need can be as simple as you want to make it, and you can make it super basic. It can also be as complicated as you can possibly make something. It's, uh, it's got the whole range, you know? Need is the catch-all of alcohol. And I think when you start talking about the, um, uh, as my friend uh, doing the most says, the triforce of balance, and you're talking about your tannic values, you're talking about your sweetness contrast, you're talking about your, your sour side, all of these things. I think that's where it really gets deep. Like when I try your stuff, I can tell that you have balanced it well, you've attained the sweetness, you have a, a tannic value there. Those are things that come with experience of tasting mead, but also are uh are learned through um experimentation and so that's where i think by by its base value it's, it's simple but experimentation uh, will yield understanding so oh yeah that's people always ask you know if i'm working in the hall they're always like well, what's what's your favorite mead and my go-to is always traditional and like my part of what i love about it is that there's so little else in it that you really get a taste for the fermentation of that particular batch of honey. Mm -hmm. And the traditional is, it's a tough one only because you are reliant on three things. And I think a lot of people struggle because if they don't go off and purchase higher quality honey, you're using um, nothing, nothing wrong with using uh, a cheaper honey if you can get it, but higher quality honey generally has less uh, processing, which then you retain more. And so I think that like that, whatever blueberry blossom honey you get, that's um, raw, unfiltered, is going to have more to provide in a traditional than a blueberry honey that has been filtered, that has been pasteurized, that has been, you know, XYZ in order to um, whatever, make it uh, more filtered or do whatever. So I, I think that people get dissuaded from making mead because they hear they see a video um like one of mine and they go oh well, this looks easy they walk into walmart and they grab seven honey bears and then they walk out and they throw you know some some bread yeast in and then throw their tap water in which tap water is not bad some is and then they wonder what happens you're like why is this this isn't what i expected are you kidding me so all this to say start with good ingredients and just make more mead. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> nice. More mead, more better. <laughs> yeah, seriously though. Okay, I want to switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about, I know I'm not going to ask for any of your trade secrets or anything like that. And you're welcome to say, to not answer this. Do you have a specific, even brand of yeast you like to use? Are you guys D47 fans? Are you you know, why yeast, whatever. No more questions. No more questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, no. Yeast are all good. We've used, no. uh, we've used some D47 in the past. We used some 71B. Um, we've kind of settled on EC1118. It's a, it's a powerhouse of a yeast. Um, a lot of places end up not using it because mm -hmm. if you're not extremely careful and extremely clean, um, you're going to end up with yeast in your final product and you're going to end up with something that's 17% dry and full of bubbles, um, which sometimes that's delicious, but if that's not what you're going for, it can be kind of a, kind of a bad news train there. Um, so we've kind of stuck with EC1118 and sort of that whole philosophy, like talking about stripping yeast out and everything else. Um, I personally have taken that yeast all the way to 22%. Um, so you can really get that beast cooking. Um, you know, it takes six months, but like you can really get it high up there. And so doing, you know, staying lower alcohol content, 13%, somewhere around there just kind of helps, at least in my mind, I don't have the science to back it, but it, it helps alleviate more stress off of that yeast so that they can just go about doing what they're supposed to be doing, making out, making tasty alcohol. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say that about EC1118. I've always, I've loved the yeast for a long time, but I can't tell you how many comments have lambasted me for using it, saying that because it's a champagne yeast, you can never make a good product and that it just, it just blows off every aroma, everything about the mead. And I've never felt that way. Um, I've always seen it as a, 
a really good yeast and like I said, a powerhouse in its own right. So um, I, it is encouraging to hear someone else using it and having great results in, in those things. So I, that's nice to hear. <laughs> Um, okay. It. We still keep some of the other yeasts around, but like we only use them if it's like, uh oh, we we ran out of yeast and we're having to find some more. So like, all right, let's go fifty fifty seventy one B and fifty fifty EC one 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 eight. So you guys don't do any any house strain or anything like that at this point. You're just you're just keeping to one 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 eight generally. For now, uh, Perez and Irvin tried to catch, it's the Nick, the Nick duo. Uh, they tried to catch a little bit of wild yeast. We did a, uh, we did an employee retreat uh, a couple of weeks back, I guess almost a month ago now. I'm still healing from it. And uh, like we tried to catch a little yeast out there. We put out some buckets uh, just overnight up in kind of a mixed Aspen pine tree sort of grove and uh, didn't catch anything, unfortunately. Um, except for some tasty moths. They were good. Maybe, maybe I was the only one that ate those, I guess. <laughs> Whatever. But, uh, but no, we didn't end up catching anything, but I would love to. There's one of my favorite breweries here that has a yeast strain that they caught wild, 928, both of you guys know it. Um, and they caught it wild, and they have it propagated now for them, um, which I think is just fantastic, and it's one of my favorites. Uh, I think there's definitely some some advantages to using a wild yeast you know over a uh, using using a elk instead of a cow sort of a situation i guess um but we haven't uh, we haven't found one that we like yet so we're gonna we're gonna keep trying to catch some more and uh, i'd love to come up with something that we make maybe even if it's only like a session you know because a lot of the stuff you end up catching in the wild doesn't necessarily go super high alcohol content you kind of have to train that into them a little bit but um but i would love to do a session with a wild yeast it would be fantastic i mean you already have a product that has no added sulfites or sorbates and if we could add wild yeast to that wicked combo that's a that'd be beautiful yeah, really. Yeah, I think that's something definitely that'll be pushed more in our future once we start adding barrels uh, more and more to our our portfolio. Uh, once we have space for barrels, but I think uh, yeah, capturing wild yeast has always been something that I have fallen in love with. I was a biology teacher for nine years and then, you know, did a bunch of brewing and I would go out and catch wild yeast and plate it and do all this fun stuff with it. And yeah, I can't wait to to see what that kind of situation can bring to mead instead of beer. Mm. I did a, um, an experiment where I, I grabbed a bunch of snow um, that had fallen. Of course, watched where I got it, of course. And uh, then I did a wild yeast <laughs> mead with some blueberry and some honey that I had. And I ended up uh, oaking it for a little bit with an oak uh, stave and um then back sweetening with maple syrup and it was the wild yeast itself was just so different from everything else i've ever tried very unpredictable and in my attempt to um, be as natural as possible i didn't want to add any sorbate or metabisulfites and it was like a three gallon batch so i didn't have an easy way to pasteurize so i was like it, it stopped at like 10, 10. It's been here for like four weeks. Like it probably is good. It probably is not going to go further. So I back sweetened that sucker kicked back up and I was like, Oh, well, uh, good morning. So they, uh, they started going again, but it, it was, it was fine. It's a testament to the, um, odd, uh, oddness that is wild yeast and unpredictability. So you kind of have to still be safe when using them but they are very fun to use, no doubt. How did it smell while fermenting? Did it have like a nice, that nice fermenting? I just remember, I remember one of Nick's batches of wild yeast that he caught and when it was fermenting, it, it smelled awful. Like, like hot garbage. Hot yeah. garbage. It ended up being a pretty tasty beer. Yeah. yeah. But during <laughs> fermentation, it was just, oh, it was so stinky. <laughs> there was, um, I think there was something pleasant with the blueberries that might've saved any possible oddness in that regard I, i'm sure if it was a traditional reliant only on those things i might have caught more i didn't catch anything that was like oh i should toss this out um while i was doing it but it turned out to be pretty interesting and i i encourage anyone to try and harvest or get some wild yeast from somewhere and try and use it yourself because it is worth a try at least once 
just to know what happens. Nick uh, Perez, have you ever done any wild yeast experiments with your home brewing? No, nothing on a wild yeast level. Yeah, I feel like I just usually stick with, uh, you know, I guess as brands go, I've always worked with uh, Lalvin or Red Star uh, for mead yeasts. If I'm making some sort of beer recipe, I usually go with White Labs or Y yeast. You know, try to try to stick with, you know, the, like I said, the scientists that have done the work to say, hey, this is the particular style that's going to do well for what you're doing. You know, especially as much as it costs, you know, even on a homebrew scale, if I'm going to spend the money, I want to make sure it turns out okay, not take the risk that, you know, five or more gallons just has to go down the drain. Yeah, I'll say that having a YouTube channel where my whole goal is to um, educate people on the good and the bad definitely allows me to experiment. And, you know, if that batch had turned out really bad, I still would have posted the video and been like, that was garbage. So, you know, I'm able to, in some ways, do more crazy stuff with less worry. Whereas if I were, not that I wouldn't experiment if I didn't do YouTube videos, but I think my experiments would be a little more tame, um, a little less costly. Yeah, especially if it's mead related, you know, I mean, I know yeah. with, with your smaller batches, you know, doing one or one or two gallons may not be as bad, but you know, for my setups, you know, I usually do five to seven gallons at a time. And if I'm going to spend that much money on honey and time and space and effort, you know, I would hate for any of that to, to be wasted on something that didn't turn out okay. Yeah, it's, it's never fun to pour yeah, stuff down. When you there. have an audience, uh, you, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know what audiences uh, like pretty much just as much as Pretty Rainbows. They, they love, you know, dumpster fires as well. So when you've got an audience, it's all good content. <laughs> oh, it's, it's fun. I love getting to just do stupid stuff. Um, you know, that's, that's, I like making fun recipes and hopefully things that are repeatable by people, but I also want to, I want to have my fun too and just mess around and, you know, make a mead like this where I'm just literally trying to torch it to death to see what will happen and <laughs> we'll see what happens. So, okay. So I want to switch a no, little I'm, bit I'm, now. I'm going to be super excited to see what you end up with, with that one. That'll be, I'll let you I'm, know. I'll, I'll let you know. Interested. It's uh, in touch. <laughs> it'll, well, you'll hear, you'll see it for sure. Hey, let's talk about, so um, you guys are a, a fairly new meadery, and I want to know about some of the challenges um, you guys faced, S not only starting a meadery, but like we talked about COVID. Um, what are some things that for anyone who aspires to own a mead meadery um, to know? What do they need to really understand before they do it? Uh, paperwork. I hate to say that, like it's the most discouraging thing um, is that there's just a ton of paperwork. There's a whole lot of taxes to it. I mean, we get, we get taxed just for making it. Like before you even sell it, there's a tax. And then of course we have like retail taxes and then we have another tax on top of retail taxes, which is we're also taxed by the state by volume. So that just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of paperwork. And of course, like with taxes, like that's, that's one of the number one business killers is people mm -hmm. not, not getting their numbers right and not reporting the right amounts or not getting the right amount of taxes to folks. Um, and that's the, that's the sad end of things. You know, when I started this, like, it was like, oh, I just want to be experimental and make all kinds of mead that people will buy. And, and I didn't make it anymore. You know, I get to come in the back and the guys have me taste stuff and I give my seal of approval on it. Um, pretty much always. Cause they're always making amazing stuff, but like, I don't even get to make it that much anymore. A lot of my time is, is spent taken up with, with paperwork and meetings and acquisitions of, of, you know, things to either make it supply chain issue stuff, you know, all of that. And so it, it ends up being a lot less mead making than I would, than I would like it to be for myself. Um, I mean, this might go on long enough. I might actually be one of the few like meadery owners that ends up restarting their whole homebrew process just so that I can mess around with stuff. Um, just cause it's, there's just so much, there's so much paperwork and so many little ends to tie up always, always. Um, and so that's definitely like something, something that I didn't expect out of it, um, was, was all the paperwork and all the little bits to it. I, I mean, for us too, I, I did not expect to grow this fast. I mean, we had no employees four years ago and now we've got, I don't know, there's like 11 or 12 of us. I should probably know better, but like there's, there's a whole garbledy gook of us and it's, it's a motley crew and it makes a fantastic family. And, um, so I, I don't think I expected that either, you know, that it would end up kind of turning, turning into the family that it is. 
um, are definitely things that, that I didn't expect. So hopefully somebody else can kind of expect that, at least expect the paperwork part, because that's coming at you no matter what. Yeah, no, I, and I uh, think it's interesting. Train noise. I think it's interesting because obviously everybody, depending on your state, you have different laws, you have different regulations. And so there are some, some things to point to to say, if you're interested in doing it, make sure you look at your state's laws, look at your country's laws if you're outside of the U.S. and, and what it means to start these things. Because like you're saying, there's a lot more than just uh, mixing honey water and yeast and, you know, giving it to people. There's a lot of le legal things. And um, I think that some people believe that it, it is as simple as just making the product. And unfortunately, we don't live in that world. It'd be nice if we could just, you know, walk out and sell it like lemonade. But and I don't know that people will respond to that as well. Oh, crap. You're, we're not allowed to do that? <laughs> <laughs> like, says, oh. says the guy in charge of marketing. <laughs> Close the podcast. Close it off. <laughs> Stop now. Stop now. Wait, we're supposed to be paying taxes? Oh, <laughs> oh no. Oh. Okay, so one more little question right. for you guys. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, no. I, I don't even know where I was actually going with that. So it was, it was perfectly timed. <laughs> oh, so I was going to say, if you, um, what was, what's like one, one tip, I guess you would give someone who's interested in opening a meadery, uh, obviously to anticipate taxes and um, all of the behind the scenes stuff. But is there anything that you wish you had known uh, other than those things that would have helped you now? I think, I think one of the hardest things, so I was, I was reading that question earlier and I've actually been thinking about it all day because um, we do help you know, other meteries kind of get up and started. We, we help scale and fair kind of get their feet on the ground just as far as as much you know, information about all that tax stuff and everything else you can give away. Superstition helped us kind of get our feet on the ground, um, especially with like Vino Shipper and a few of those other things. They were super helpful um, to us. Jeff and Jen are awesome folk. Um, but uh, I think the biggest thing that I would tell people, and this, I was, I had a hard time with this earlier because the advice that I wanted to give was always be purchasing stuff with the thought of your expansion in mind. Um, and that's really, really hard when you're small because like you're literally scrapping together every little bit of, of money that you can put into something like this. Um, in the, in the, the little business classes I took at, at the community thing up here, um, they, they call it the three F's. And I don't particularly like the third F. It kind of, I don't like it, but it's, you're supposed to, your, your first source of money when you're trying to put together a business or anything like that is friends, family, and fools. Um, I don't like the fools part. I don't like to think anybody that was a fool invested with our company. Um, but it, it is that basic part of like, that's kind of a roundabout way of getting back to it, but buy equipment that you can grow into. Don't buy equipment that like, this will do for what I need right now. Buy equipment that's like, okay, yeah, this, this is going to be good for these, these three fives back here. But like, what about the seven or the 12 that like, I want to get, you know, two years or a year or for us, you know, later this year, what do I, what can I do with that? Am I going to, how much am I going to have to replace in parts just to be able to do that? Because I got like the most discount item that I possibly could to get you through. And like, you, you do have to temper that with just what you have for funding to be able to get stuff and, and make sure to put it, put it in the right spots, you know? And uh, I guess the biggest thing that I would say, and this is, this is a hard one for a lot of small business owners, is make good protocol and, and be prepared to hand things over to other people. Be prepared to give that off. Be prepared for somebody else to do something that you've been doing for a long time and be willing to work with them and not get frustrated because they don't just do it your way. Um, and so I think that's, that's probably... Is that good? You're looking at me like that was good. It felt yeah. good. I'm almost tearing up here just thinking about like, you know, it's been, it really has, it's been such a struggle, but it's been, it's been good too. And surrounding yourself with, with people that know more than you do, just like we were talking at the beginning of this, you know, getting information from, from brewers that have done whatever it is, just learn, 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 and surround your people, surround yourself with people that are better than you at the things you want it done and be willing to acknowledge that uh, they're better than you at it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the hardest things is to go knock on someone's door and ask them a question um, about any part of the process, because, you know, it's, I think that's just a little bit of human nature, but the moment you find the people who will answer that, um, yeah, that's, that's a huge stress off your back. And I would 
definitely reiterate the, if you can make a plan for expansion and whatever that is, small, tiny steps, medium steps, you know, you don't have to have a warehouse that's 8,000 times what you're doing right now. Um, but like, you know, think about your stub out sphere chiller. If you get more tanks, you know, just start, start asking the questions of, of people that are slightly bigger than you and, and what would they do? Like, just like you're asking, um, you know, what, what, would you be prepared to do? Because expansion, um, if you really put your heart and soul and passion into it, expansion is going to come, um, you know, knock on wood or whatever. But um, yeah, I think that was a great, a great bit of advice for sure. Knock on scaring off our neighbors so we can take over their warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think you talk about it on your channel a lot that the mead community in general is like pretty small. And I guess if you compare that to beer and wine that I think, you know, networking is probably a huge factor, you know, make friends with, with your competitors and in the best way that you can, you know, and, and, and to our, our team, I think having the, the team that we have is probably the best part of, you know, how we're able to enjoy what we're doing, do it great, you know, and, and, and have fun with it at the same time. You know, if you're not having fun, why are you, why are you doing it? Hello, podcast listeners and watchers. If you are enjoying this podcast, check out my Patreon. It is patreon.com slash manmade mead. For two bucks a month or more, if you want to support the channel more, you can gain exclusive access and early access to all of my videos. You can also support the channel, help me create new content, and rest easy know knowing that I am able to do more with this mead community. I hope that you enjoy this podcast and I hope you will come and support me on Patreon if you'd like even more mead content. Yeah, no, I think you guys are, I know nothing about the commercial mead side other than I've tried things and I've talked to people. So I can't um, say that, uh, I can't say anything on this side, but I know that everything I've heard from you guys and from other people is that using your friends, using other people who know more or equal to you uh is is helpful because they this is a team effort and obviously you know you guys are a big team and i i think that you can start as a singular entity but life's a whole lot more fun with a uh with a friend by your side so i think that we all have, all have to remember that as we're not only pursuing um just making mead but if you go further with it so thank you guys for like I don't, I don't think you realize just how valuable, um, your, your expertise and your willingness to talk about these things is for people. I know that I get people who, who contact me and say, Hey, I listened to this and, um, I loved hearing this from this person. And I have no doubt that you guys have helped to inspire this next growing mean making community. And I, um, and I really want to make sure that everyone knows where to contact you and where to find you guys. So are you guys on Vino Shipper? Are you guys in Total Wine? Where can we buy your products? So we are definitely on Vino Shipper. We ship right now at this time to 36 states, um, not Oklahoma, unfortunately, sorry. Um, and I still have family members there, so I would love that. But uh, yeah, Vino Shipper, absolutely. You can find it on our website, drinkinghornmeadery.com. Uh, we are in all the... Uh, other than that, we're just in local shops in Arizona. Uh, and so we're in all the Whole Foods, Arizona, and a handful of other shops you can find. If you're in Arizona and you're looking for us, you can find it on our website as well. We've got a little map um, to figure that out. So www.drinkinghornmeadery.com. Oh, you have to do the HTTPS slash slash colon www. <laughs> I get lost with that, though, um, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, you can find us. Yeah, uh, and it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, you really <laughs> got to remember that. Technology needs to catch up with that problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, that's where you can find us as far as purchasing. Um, we are, I think we're still in a size of a business that, I mean, I'm going to be packaging the bottles as soon as I get uh, and we're going to get that right out to you. We're going to throw in some goodies, um, you know, make sure everything's taken care of. That's one thing that this guy has instilled. I mean, I'd like to think that I already had it in me, but he has instilled in me um, that everyone always says like customer service is important, but Evan has shown us all like how, how passionate he is about that. And 
if you come in and you're like, eh, I think I can, they're not going to be that mad about this. No, hell no. Um, yeah. The customer for us is, is taken very well care of. Every so, bottle counts. It does. Every bottle, especially when you're in something so new, again, oldest beverage ever, but, but still new to so many people, it's a responsibility to make sure that that person, that person's first experience or maybe second, their new experience with mead is a good one, is a great one, is a wonderful one because that is their first experience. And if they pick up a glass of mead and they drink it and either for whatever reason, a variety of reasons, they don't have an absolutely glorious time, which, you know, mead is meant for, then they're, they're going to drop me. They're going to be like, nope, I'm going back to my other beverage and I'm never giving this a go again. So customer service, definitely where in the world was I going? Oh, packaging. Yeah. So every package is made with care and the customer <laughs> um, is, is in the forefront. So yes, you can find us on V Shipper. You can find us on all the socials too. Oh, absolutely. You want me to plug socials? Man, we, we have a blast. Um, <laughs> that's another great thing about a new community is bringing in new people to meet and, and showing them how, uh, how I'm sorry, kick-ass um, bees are and, and honey and Norse mythology and how crazy that is. So uh, anyway, our socials, yeah, Facebook, obviously, Instagram, um, TikTok, we're growing and growing on tip. TikTok, uh, tip top. It's tip the top. tip top. Um, YouTube, uh, you know, we have uh, just a little bit less subscribers than YouTube. Only, <laughs> Only 25 and a half thousand less. less. Um, but we've got, we got a good YouTube channel. I think uh, we, we have some fun on that. So yeah, yeah we're out there. Out there, every, Twitter. Twitter, yep. We're in the Twitterverse. I'll, uh, I'll try and plug all of these things um, down below in the YouTube link of this video. And of course, in the if you're listening to the podcast version, it should be down there as well. Feel free to follow these guys, not only just to see what they're doing, but also to figure out how to get a hold of their stuff. Obviously, as they grow, um, availability will be better and better. And uh, I have greatly enjoyed getting to try um, their mead. And I have no doubt that everyone listening will enjoy trying really interesting things like the root beer mead root beer or the meat hito stuff that i uh have never thought of and i have never seen on a shelf and so stuff like that is it's it very intriguing and i'm i'm impressed so i hope you guys will check them out thank you guys for your time i know that you um coming off of your your monday night live things and you're, you've had a long day as it is. So I appreciate you guys taking the time to help me out and to chat with, with everybody. Um, it's been a blast. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Oh, thank you so much for having us. I mean, any, any time we're all yours, Garrett. Yeah. All this yours. is the fun part. Well, you, this is not the last time you'll see him. You'll see him in the future video. We're about to uh, record some fun stuff. So you'll see them again, but thank you guys for your time. We'll do this hopefully again soon. Sounds good, man. We'll, we'll see you soon. Cheers. Cheers to everybody out there. Skull. <laughs>